A good place to start when you're studying organic chemistry is with the various ways that organic molecules are represented. Because they tend to involve a lot of bonds and a lot of atoms, we make use of shorthand and some shortcuts and conventions to represent structure. And becoming familiar with these conventions is going to be really important as you progress through your studies of organic structures and reactions. And so in this unit, we're going to draw and interpret representations of structures of organic compounds that incorporate these shorthand conventions. And we're going to learn how to interpret the shorthand to expand implied hydrogen atoms and lone pairs. And this idea that we should expand implied hydrogens around reactive centers was taught to me years ago by Bob Grossman at the University of Kentucky. And he rather narcissistically called it Grossman's rule. We're going to learn about functional groups. We're going to introduce the concept of a functional group and learn how to identify and label them. We'll also interpret three-dimensional representations of organic structures using wedges and dashes for the time being to represent bonds that are pointed out of the screen or out of the page and back into the screen or page. Now, in the second half of this unit, we're going to turn our attention to the limitations of the Lewis model, the limitations of these typical bond line structures that we draw with lines and dots representing electrons. This model of structure, the Lewis model, cuts against what we understand about the quantum mechanical nature of electrons and electron delocalization. And to account for electron delocalization without entirely throwing away the Lewis model, we make use of what's called resonance, a concept and a, a set of conventions and practices and ideas, really a whole theory that enables us to retain Lewis structures and bond line structures while still accounting for electron delocalization. And so a big difference, if you've seen resonance previously in your introductory courses, a big difference when you get to organic chemistry is you're going to need to be able to recognize when relevance it, resonance is relevant to a compound. When does a given structure have a significant alternative resonance form that we should be thinking about? We're going to talk about that in this unit so that as we come across Lewis structures of organic molecules in future studies, we'll be able to recognize and identify when resonance is in play. And resonance has to do with the delocalization of charge and delocalization of electrons to the extent that we're interested in how electrons move and what electrons can do. Recognizing the relevance of resonance is extremely important. And to close off this unit, we'll distinguish between localized lone pairs, which are well described by the Lewis model, and delocalized lone pairs that are engaged in resonance. You'll hear me refer to these as resonance active lone pairs. The electrons were pushing around as we interconvert between resonance structures. Resonance has important structural implications, primarily related to hybridization, geometry, and bond length. And so where resonance is in play, these resonance active atoms and electrons pairs, we need to deepen our understanding of hybridization and geometry beyond the introductory level to some degree, and we'll do that in this unit. This slide introduces three representations of organic compounds, one of which has essentially all of the information about structure that we would want to care about as far as how the atoms are connected and where the electrons are located, and the other two have some compression of information, which really hides some of the visual complexity that's not super important to the properties or reactivity of the molecule, making things more efficient and, and more easy to parse. So the first we've seen before, it's Lewis structures. Lewis structures show all the atoms and bonds in the molecule and generally account for all of the valence electrons, including non-bonding electrons. So you see non-bonding electron pairs as pairs of dots and bonds as lines, and we can have single, double, and triple bonds represented with one, two, and three lines respectively in Lewis structures. There's no geometric information here necessarily in a Lewis structure, and we'll talk about the three-dimensional conventions for organic molecules here a little bit down the line, but when you see this kind of right angle representation, where we've got an atom that clearly should be tetrahedral, for example, here at the center, the central carbon, with sort of cross-like bonds, there's no geometric information implied here. A partially condensed structure takes the CH bonds and just puts carbon and hydrogen next to each other. And it's implied that the carbon and hydrogens are linked to each other. So if you see something like a CHN, so CH, CH2, CH3, this means N hydrogens linked to that carbon atom. So a CH3, for example, has three hydrogens all linked to this carbon. And 
because hydrogen forms one and only one bond, we can infer in these partially condensed and in the fully condensed structures, where we even omit the carbon-carbon bonds, that the heavy atoms are linked to each other. So in a fully condensed structure like this, it's pure text, no lines, no dots. Lone pairs are often hidden as well, although you'll sometimes see lone pairs written around the heteroatoms, non-carbon and, and non-hydrogen, like this. So this condensed structure implies that the carbons are linked to each other and carbon is linked to oxygen. So there's a bond here between C and O, and there is a bond between one of these Cs and this C, and the other carbon implied by this CH3-2 is also linked to that carbon at the center. Because hydrogen forms one and only one bond, it's implied and assumed that hydrogen is linked to whichever atom is, is closest to it in the condensed formula. So for example, this H is linked to the carbon that comes right before it in the formula, and this hydrogen is linked to this oxygen to form an OH or hydroxyl group. Let's practice expanding a condensed structure to a full-blown Lewis structure on this slide. So we have this condensed structure in blue. It's pure text except for this equals sign looking symbol, which indicates a double bond between these two carbons. I think it's helpful here to start to number the carbons, just to make sure that we account for every atom that's implied by this condensed formula. Notice, for example, that the CH3 in parentheses with the subscript 2 implies two methyl groups linked to carbon 3. So let's number those methyl carbons 1 and 2. Carbons 3 and 4 are linked by a double bond, and notice that we have an H here that is linked directly to carbon 4. It follows it immediately in the condensed formula, implying that it is directly connected to carbon 4. And carbons 5 and 6 are linked to each other and form a separate group that's also linked to carbon 4. So this can be easy to miss in the formula, but the highlighting hopefully makes this clear that the H and the CH2CH3 group are independently linked to carbon 4. So now that we've sort of parsed through the condensed formula like this, we can draw the carbon skeleton, and this is what I would encourage you to do next. We've got carbons 3 and 4 at the middle linked by this double bond. And we already said there are two methyl groups, two CH3 groups, CH3 is known as the methyl group, linked to carbon 3, and those are carbons 1 and 2. On the other side, we have carbons 5 and 6 that are linked to carbon 4. Specifically, carbon 5 is linked to carbon 4, and carbon 6 which follows carbon-5 in the condensed formula, is linked to carbon-5. So this is our carbon skeleton. We've accounted for all of the carbons in the structure at this point, carbons 1 through 6. Next up is to add the hydrogens. To add the hydrogens, look for the H's that are next to the carbons or other atoms in the condensed formula. So here we've got three H's adjacent to each C inside parentheses, so we're going to have three hydrogens linked to carbons 1 and 2, three hydrogens each. Carbon 4 has that orange highlighted hydrogen that it's also linked to. Carbon 5 has two hydrogens linked to it, CH2 implies a structure like this. And then carbon 6 is another methyl group, another CH3, with three hydrogens linked to the carbon. And now notice here one more time that the H highlighted in orange is a separate group from the CH2CH3. Both are linked to carbon-4, but they're linked independent of one another. And if we follow this idea that H is immediately following a heavy atom are linked to that heavy atom, this is a convention for condensed structures, we'll be able to parse out condensed structures to um, infer structures like this. One more thing that I'll point out before we leave this slide is that every carbon in this structure is satisfying the octet rule, four bonds, right? Eight total electrons. The hydrogens are satis satisfying the so-called duet rule, right? Each of those has two total electrons, and we account for the double bond that's built into the condensed formula. Double and triple bonds do typically appear in condensed formulas to make it very clear where double and triple bonds exist between carbons in these condensed formulas. One other thing we should note before moving forward is that condensed structures are generally only used for relatively simple structures without a lot of branching. When you start getting a lot of branching in the structure, it becomes very difficult and in some cases impossible to actually parse out just a line of text, right? And so condensed structural formulas are generally only used when we have a relatively simple uh, structure with very little branching.